Hi, everyone. Uh, we'll get started. Um, and just to welcome everybody, uh, my name is Jessica Hong, and I am the Associate Curator of Global Contemporary Art at Dartmouth's Hood Museum of Art. We first want to begin by acknowledging that the Hood Museum and Dartmouth's Hood and Dartmouth College sit upon the lands and near the waters of the Abenaki peoples. We recognize that the Hood Museum and Dartmouth were built without permission from Abenaki tribal nations. We acknowledge the significance of this place and the continued existence of indigenous peoples, and we commit to building respectful relationships with those who call these lands home today. Thank you, Jessica. I'm Ariana Cachon, Curator of Global Contemporary Art at the Smart Museum at University of Chicago. I would like to acknowledge that we at the Smart Museum at the University of Chicago are gathered together today on the traditional homelands of the Ho-Chunk, Missouri, Iowa, Oto, Miamia, Potawatomi, Anoka, Kickapoo, Menomini, Ojibwe, Meskwaki, Sauk, and Odawa. I would also like to acknowledge and give thanks that Chicago has the third largest native urban population in the United States. I'm excited that we have been able to come together across two university art museums, the Smart Museum at the University of Chicago and the Hood Museum at Dartmouth to host this event today. Before we get started, I'd like to thank the entire teams at the Smart and at the Hood Museums, especially Simone Levine, Sharon Reed, Aaron Wilder, and Isadora Italia for all of their labor behind the scenes to put on this program. But also like to thank the University of Chicago's Feitler Center for Academic Inquiry and the Center for East Asian Studies for their generous support. Since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, the art world has changed in varying ways. Exhibitions have been postponed, art fairs canceled, and much of the international travel and shipping that helped to produce and animate contemporary art events has ground to a halt. This temporary pause has allowed many of us to reflect on the institutions in which we work and visit, and the ways in which these institutions respond to our local communities. To reassess our normal operating procedures, and often to identify the limitations and blind spots of our practices as curators and scholars. In the US, the Black Lives Matter movement has demanded changes to address equity and access in American art museums, cultural institutions, and art galleries. These shifts have profoundly impacted how we think of the so-called global art world and the global turn in art history and contemporary curatorial practice. The title of this program comes from the 2015 Venice Biennale curated by the late and influential curator, scholar, and thinker Okui and Weiser, because we also hope to consider the current state of things as well as future states of things. Incredibly, it's been a year since the first COVID-19 cases were publicly identified in the US, which upended our lives as we knew it for an unforeseeable future. So we wanted this panel to be a space of reflection to consider the impacts of the pandemic on global practices and perhaps even the possibilities that may have arisen. We are delighted to welcome artists Hotsu Yen, Serge Alan Nidegeka, and Project Anywhere's Sean Lowry and Simone Douglas to take part in this conversation, which we hope is one of many. We've included their brief bios, or we will be including their brief bios in the chat but we encourage you to look into their work in further depth after this program. We invited these particular speakers because their practices were already actively contending with many of the questions, issues, and concerns this panel intends to consider. And they're so dedicated that a few of our speakers are participating at either very late or very early hours in their time zones. So our deepest thanks to all of our panelists. To start off the program, we'll be asking Sue, Serge, Sean, and Simone to briefly introduce their work. Once these presentations are finished, we will convene together for a broader discussion and then open up for questions from the audience. We ask that you use Zoom's Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to send us your questions throughout the program. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Sue to the stage. Hello, everyone. Good morning. 
Um, thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure to be able to share my work uh, with you at this time. So I think I will jump uh, right into it and uh, by way of introduction, speak a little bit about one of my works, uh, which is called The Critical Dictionary of Southeast Asia. So this project is, a, is an ongoing project. I don't really know exactly when it began. So 2012 is kind of a placeholder. Um, shall we move to the next slide, please? Yeah, so um, this is an image, a documentation of the work uh, installed at the Hamburg Kunstverein. Um, what we are seeing here is a single channel uh, video. And uh, the contents of the video is, uh, are actually um, uh, algorithmically uh, composed. So there is a set of algorithms which is putting together this video in real time, as well as uh, choosing between uh, different versions of uh, voiceovers to accompany the images. But I want to point your attention to uh, the, the back of the screen where there are these strips of LEDs. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? So what we are seeing here is the, the LEDs, uh, LED lights slowly uh, flashing. And can we move to the next slide? And that's all of the LED lights uh, turned up. So these LED lights, basically, um, they wipe the image off. These LED lights comes from the back of the screen while the images are projected from the front. And these, these LED lights are triggered by the same algorithms which are editing the film um, live. So uh, I would like to speak a little bit more about the contents of uh, this work, but first uh, I will also speak about um, how this work has been uh, distributed. So other than being um, shown uh, in galleries and museums, as we are seeing here in the image, uh, this work also has an online presence. Uh, next slide. So um, this is the website uh, address of the work. So um, I thought of speaking about this work because it has an online uh, component. Um, and last year, uh, this work sort of continues uh, to be alive. Um, so it has given me some comfort to know that this work was there and available um, last year while many shows uh, have been postponed or canceled. Um, so on this, shall, uh, next slide, please. So this is a, a screenshot of the website. So on the website, what we are seeing is this video, which is algorithmically composed. All of the images on the, for this work comes from various online sources, such as YouTube, uh, Vimeo, and some torrent websites. And what we have is an algorithm, which is composing, uh, re-editing these films uh, in real time and selecting between uh, different versions of the voiceover to accompany it. So for example, on um, this website, you see at the top right-hand corner, you could, we can select between the video and also the index. So with the index, what you have are notes, uh, my notes on um, this uh, work. And on the bottom right corner, we have uh, subtitles. So there are uh, subtitles in a few different languages that we can select from. And the title of this work is The Critical Dictionary of Southeast Asia. And what we are seeing is uh, essentially 26 terms, one for each uh, letter of the alphabet. Um, and each of these terms is for me a way to reconfigure and to rethink what Southeast Asia possibly is. Um, next slide. So uh, this is in many ways the starting point of the project, uh, which is essentially a question. And the question is what constitutes the unity of Southeast Asia, which is a region never unified by a single religion, 
language or political system. So I'd like to speak a little bit more about this. Um, next slide. And to begin with, it's uh, you know good for us to have uh, to refresh ourselves about what uh, where Southeast Asia exactly is. Um, but what is interesting uh, is that this term Southeast Asia um, didn't come from within the region. So um, actually, I would say it's uh, it's quite recent when this term uh, began to circulate. Uh, next slide. Actually, the earliest uh, instance in which this term Southeast Asia can be found um, is in this book, uh, 1941, um, Progress and Welfare in Southeast Asia. So this is probably the first instance in which uh, this word Southeast Asia is used um, uh, in the sense that we are deploying it uh, now. Next slide. But the term really started to circulate actually uh, in the midst of the Second World War. Um, this uh, a, a, com a strategic uh, command unit known as Southeast Asian Command was set up during the Second World War um, as a, by the Allied forces as a way to uh, liberate Southeast Asia uh, from the Japanese occupation by which I meant uh, a lot of these uh, uh, allied forces actually wanted to recolonize uh, Southeast Asia from the Japanese. So um, as I said, this term did not come from within the region uh, and it really started circulating after the Second World War. But you know, after half a century, uh, this term and this idea of Southeast Asia also began to take on a certain um, historical weight. So in many ways, uh, the Critical Dictionary of Southeast Asia is meant as a project uh, that things um, that uses sort of the fuzzy outlines of this object, Southeast Asia, uh, to generate projects and ideas. So um, maybe just very quickly, I will speak about one of the terms uh, in the dictionary. Next slide. Uh, a for L attitude and A for anarchism. A, sorry, A for altitude and A for anarchism. Uh, next slide. And what we are seeing uh, with the next three slides are just screenshots from the dictionary when it's on the letter A. Next slide. And next slide. So with this term, I'm looking into the relationship between altitudes and anarchism in Southeast Asia. So next slide. So um, thinking about high altitudes, which is this uh, in, in this area that we uh, refer to as Zomia, which is a highland area, 300 meters above ground. And it cuts across uh, about seven different nation states. And on this highlands are many tribes which has never been absorbed by any of the surrounding nation states. So thinking about this relationship between high altitudes and attitudes of anarchism. Next slide. And I'm also looking at the low altitudes, basically sea level, uh, where we look at this area called the Sulu Sea which is tri-bordered by uh, the Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia, and which <clears throat> piracy, as well as uh, uh, many kind of non-state activities um, still uh, take place within this uh, area. So looking again at the high and low altitudes and how that relates to anarchism. So I will finish off uh, with the next term that I'll speak about. Next slide. So T for tiger and T for theodolite. Next slide. So these are uh, sort of screenshots again from the dictionary. So um, this term sort of tracks, looks into the tiger and tigers have basically uh, distributed or dispersed uh, across Southeast Asia more than a million years ago when Southeast Asia was a single land mass known as the Sunda Shelf. So after that sea levels rose and broke 
the Sunda into um, sort of the existing configuration of Southeast Asia. And so tigers basically were in Southeast Asia uh, long before Homo sapiens arrived. So uh, next slide. So in uh, many Southeast Asian cultures, actually one of the few things I find that extends across the entire Southeast Asia is this belief that ancestors are tigers or ancestors, our ancestors can um, sort of uh, uh, use tigers as a kind of medium for transportation. And there's also the belief that shamans uh, have the ability to transform into tigers or wear tigers. So uh, in this term, we try to relook Southeast Asia uh, by tracking uh, the tiger um, across this region. And next slide. So yeah, again, uh, this is the website address. So please um, yeah, check it out if you have the time and interest. I think with that, I will stop the introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sue, for that. And now we'd love to welcome Serge to the proverbial stage. Hello, everyone. Um, Serge, um, currently zooming in from Johannesburg. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, I've chosen to talk about my work um, from the current exhibition I'm having in Johannesburg. Uh, the show is titled uh, Lost and Found. And um, I have chosen the, the following works to talk about um, identity and how identity is fragile. Um, my work is, uh, let me just first talk about why I chose these works mainly and my process um, getting to that is that, um, during this time, I felt that um, my work um, has had a very interesting intersection with what has been happening with the pandemic, in the sense that there's been uh, restriction of movement um, quite severely, uh, which kind of um, resonates with my um, study into forced migration and how that has been um, uh, a restrictive uh, time in history uh, for those involved, refugees and asylum seekers uh, moving across borders, um, seeking refuge, refuge um, and escaping from persecution. So I've chosen these works to um, talk about uh, some of those uh, similarities and parallels uh, in this time. And um, so the kind of identity um, I would like to talk about is not the one defined by borders or um, the kind of identity inscribed in passports and identity documents or the one handed down from our parents or uh, any kind of mainstream wave identification. Um, the one I'm interested in is, 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 is one uh, that talks about identity um, from, a, from, a, from a mirror perspective. Uh, you standing in front of a mirror, looking at yourself, um, asking yourself, do I look the way I think I look? Um, what are the, some of the uh, things we can learn about and construct identities from. So the works um, we're currently seeing now are titled Identities Fragile. They are uh, the drawings out of me uh, in the nude, um, charcoal on, on wood, and I'm holding objects that I've, that I've made um, out of cardboard and canvas. Um, those objects exist in space and the photographs were taken with them and, and I tend to take those uh, photographs in, from a position where my body is tensed uh, due to the load 
that my body is uh, struggling to carry or position uh, itself with. And the idea um, is to um, pose the body as this um, blank canvas that kind of questions identity. Um, and the uh, way that alludes to uh, forced migration in the sense that here you have a black body um, with a load, uh, struggling with a load. And the first, the first, the first uh, things one thinks about uh, that comes to mind uh, are human trafficking and um, slavery, for example. And once you, you dig deeper, uh, about the artist myself, um, me being a refugee, um, you know, so those narratives come to the fore. And so forced migration is, is, uh, is what I've been looking at in these works. And I'm talking about identity as, as uh, a notion that, that is temporarily lost when one moves from uh, their place of origin, their home country, and crosses the border. There's a momentarily loss of, of being, of, of belonging. And once uh, a person, a refugee or a asylum seeker reaches a place of refuge, then they are they're able to find themselves again. Um, and the identity takes on their journey and it takes on wherever they find themselves. It, it takes on new climates, it takes on new clothes, it takes on other small things that, um, that are found in a new place. And therefore, I talk about identity as, as, as a, a notion, uh, uh, as a concept. That's, that's not rigid, that's fluid, that's influenced by circumstance that, that, that can change um, uh, uh, from forces uh, acting upon it. For example, now in this time of the COVID uh, pandemic, um, you know, many lives have been, have been turned upside down and uh, you know, for example, losing your job uh, or being restricted not to move, uh, inf infringement on uh, personal liberties, for example. Uh, you know, you know, in the name of being safe, all of that stuff, and how that how, how that kind of influences one way of thinking about themselves. It's it's basically a time of looking in the mirror. For example, on this screen, I'm looking at myself uh, talking and, and um, I'm looking at myself and uh, there's a, an imagined audience that is looking back at me. So there is also that way of thinking about, um, um, you know, the mirror and being, um, being on the other side, looking at yourself and not understanding how um, how such forces and same forces can 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 impact one one way uh, the way we think about the way you think about yourself and how you progress forward uh, um, into shaping uh, who you want to be. You know, it's been a time of great uh, exploration and self-discovery, um, especially when it comes to uh, physiological um, um, uh, changes that people have implemented in the sense that um, the things that you like about yourself, things you don't like about yourself, and, you know, um, enrolling oneself into some kind of a grueling exercise to say, for example, lose weight or change something you don't like about yourself. So identity has been, uh, you know, you know, time upside down in terms of, you know, building of oneself, uh, looking at yourself in the mirror 
and uh, grappling with that and you know seeing what you can do about it and identity in itself is from that point, point of, of view I've, I've, I've started to uh, see it as as fragile and as as, a, as, an, as an evolving uh, uh, a concept that is constantly changing and 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 uh, influenced by circumstance. I mean, we don't know. No studies have been done. It's still too early to kind of understand how the pandemic has affected us uh, uh, globally and individually. Uh, not just from a financial point of view or from a point of view of not being able to go whatever we need to go. Um, so we'll, uh, you know, this is still evolving. And th that's my way of looking at, in my practice, a way of looking at these times and drawing those parallels uh, of uh, forced migration and being forced to uh, adhere to uh, to a global notion of uh, lockdown. And uh, with that, I will end my presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Serge. With that, we'll invite Sean and Simone from Project Anywhere. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you, Arona. Um, Simone and I are going to discuss uh, Project Anywhere, which is a global exhibition model designed for illuminating the existence of art situated outside traditional programming um, venues and uh, programming schedules. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. Project Anywhere is in part sponsored by the Centre of Visual Arts, University of Melbourne. We acknowledge that University of Melbourne stands on the unceded lands of the Boomerang and Wurundjeri peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation. We also uh, like to acknowledge that artistic and cultural production has taken place across this broader continental landmass uh, for over 65,000 years. It's a privilege to be here today. Um, well, actually all of our days um, as we're speaking to you across multiple time zones. I join you today from the unceded lands of the Gadigal peoples of the Aurora Nation. I acknowledge past, present and future leaders and the ongoing importance of First Nations knowledges. The conferences and publications for Project Anywhere were first developed at New York City at Parsons School of Design, the New School. The New School stands on the unceded lands and the waters of the Lenape peoples. I acknowledge the Lenape community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. The New School also acknowledges that it was founded upon the exclusions and erasures of many Indigenous peoples including those on which our institution is located. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to the beginning of the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialization. And next slide, please. Here in Australia, we are particularly privileged to be living and working upon the lands of the oldest living continuous cultures. To help put the, the magnitude of um, that continuous 65,000 year span in context, we're looking here at Nawala Gavanmang, uh, some of the paintings that you see on the ceiling of this uh, um, engineered rock shelter here were painted 28,000 years ago and are adjacent to paintings that were uh, finished 400 years ago. And just to be mindful that song, dance and storytelling has uh, filled this space for um, tens of millennia. And we're just putting that in context before we discuss uh, any comparable collaboration across time and space in our uh, instance. Next slide, please. We are really mindful in Project Anywhere that the projects take place, um, of looking at the way projects take place within communities and um, to see whether appropriate consultation has taken place and also whether they're paying respect to the land that they stand on. Project Anywhere uses an innovative blind be um, peer review system to replace the role of curator. It provides artists and artistic researchers working outside traditional exhibition systems with peer validation, community support, and global dissemination of their work. Next slide, please. Two years after Project Anywhere started, and while Sean was a guest scholar at Parsons, we decided to experiment with another element of Project Anywhere, a conference loosely provoked by the question, 
Is there an optimum or primary point of entry into the world of a work of art? Almost like a Project Anywhere project itself, the conference took on its own form, surprising us. As it unfolded live to air, it felt less like a conference, but more like another way of experiencing work in time and space. Next slide, please. Extending upon our core exhibition program, all hosted projects are invited to participate in our biennial international conferences. From 2022, however, given the unsustainability of air travel in the wake of COVID and uh, we have a number of other issues, we're rethinking the way in which we will deliver our online or deliver our conferences in the future, possibly online. You're seeing a slide here of uh, one of our first uh, presenters in our first conference, um, Liminal Dome. And these were three uh, young artists who uh, were one of the most mesmerizing presentations. And they read out uh, kind of live to air witness accounts from the various people who'd experienced the apparent failure of their project. Um, so this was a project that was situated on the border in the ocean between Germany and Poland. And essentially you would travel down uh, from the surface of the ocean to an underwater garden and re-emerge again. Of course, the weather conditions got them and the, uh, the witness accounts were from the curators who were completely anxious seeing their artists drifting out to the ocean and crossing the border over to Poland and being returned by the Polish police into Germany. Um, and the work in the end became the presentation of the witness accounts. One of the most exciting aspects of the of our blind peer review system is that uh, some proposals that have been, um, I guess, submitted uh, by artists, for example, the artists you just saw were uh, 21 at the time, we also had mature unaffiliated artists who are accepted uh, despite the fact that uh, in some instances, uh, professors and established artists, in fact, some of whom have even participated as peer reviewers have been unsuccessful. So this uh, um, is democratize the uh, a process that is normally take, takes place within curatorship. Next slide, please. The conference was staged two years after the incept of Project Anywhere and afforded an opportunity to hear about completed as well as projects in progress. The revealing of the process swiftly became the mainstay of the first conference. People who came to listen to one talk stayed on finding the account of the work as it happened compelling. We decided to invite artists based in New York and whose work had an ethical alignment to the Project Anywhere artist to speak alongside of the Project Anywhere artist. This proved to be um, to both provide an international context for the locally based artists and an enriching community for all involved. The conference was established as a Biennale event. Over the following two conferences, while they were based at Parsons at the New School, we staged the two day conferences across different locations on campus quietly curious to see if the impact of any of the space on the response of the audience to the work. Uh, on the prior slide that you were looking at, um, you were looking at the uh, location of the auditorium, which was designed and built in the 1930s by the legendary architect Joseph Urban. And the auditorium um, was named one of the world's most powerful rooms by the ABC News in 2014, uh, thanks to the incredible roster of public figures and leaders who've spoken there. And so we were really interested to see what it would be like to place these um, radical projects within that, that context. The next slide, please. Artistic projects can be represented in many ways in their typically uneven journey from conception through production to realization and ultimately dissemination. Importantly, our global exhibition program and Align conference and publishing program seeks to represent pro projects that uh, take speculative risks and possibly fail before realization. Hence, our peer review process takes place at the point of proposal. Next slide, please. One of the highlights of the conference is the student panel that anchors the concluding day. Graduate students at Parsons are invited to meet the presenting artists, listen to the talks, and anchor the conference summary panel led by an experienced chair or a mentor. In this slide, you see DJ Spooky, or Paul Miller, leading an animated panel. An enduring memory is of Paul at a shared lunch with the student panelists avidly, avidly engaging with each of them about their own works, and to this day, they remain in contact. As another example, two of the then student panelists applied to Project Anywhere in their own right some years later, and successfully passed through the Project Anywhere peer review. They presented in the 2018 conference, Soul Series, a social drawing as a collaborative work of art and an ongoing conversation between artists Francesca Fiore and Hilary Wagner. Next slide, please. Extending upon our conference program, all our presenters at conferences are also invited to contribute to our biennial publication Anywhere. This series of books, 
uh, now designed by Ella Higgety and previously designed by Christina Levy, are now preparing, we're now preparing our fourth in this series. Next slide, please. This biennial edited volume contains contributions from presenters at our biennial conference. Contributions can include anything from scholarly texts to photo essays to annotated diagrams and graphic illustrations, or any other format that points to artistic projects located elsewhere in time and space. The Anywhere series provided another entry point for the works, and in doing so, we acknowledge that supplementary texts cannot wholly explain or account for works of art. Something is always lost and potentially gained in translation. Next slide, please. Respectful of environmental concerns, hard copies are only made for the contributing artists with the digital version of the publications being made freely available via the Project Anywhere website. Our designers responded to each series, making the publications a response or a work in their own right. In sum, the projects themselves, each artist and designer in the exhibition, powerfully suggests, or the conferences, the publications, and their projects, powerfully suggest that the world is not a fixed experience, rather that is the shapeshifter revealed through time, culture, necessity, and politics, profoundly human. Through their works, we encounter the intimate and the infinite, and their works reveal our symbolic relationship to the world where our actions and environment are entwined narratives. Next slide, please. In conclusion, we believe that art is central to broader cultural and political discourse and plays an essential role in which the way we understand ourselves and the world that we live in. The submission, the submission deadline for Project Anywhere's next global exhibition program is September 1, 2021. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. And I'll, I'm going to ask uh, the rest of our panelists um, to turn on their mics and, and videos again. And so we're just going to, again, thank you so much to all of our panelists. And we will have some time um, at the end of the, the this conversation for a public Q&A. So as you're thinking of it, or if questions pop up, please do um, drop them into the Q&A chat function, which we will get to toward the end of the conversation. But I do want to start, you know, since each of you are zooming in from different locales, you know, just to situate us, we'd like to start with a question about each of your distinct contexts. Um, though we're all experiencing the pandemic, you know, our experiences differ depending on where we're based. So how has the pandemic affected your local cultural communities? How have they adapted? And what kind of potential futures do you imagine or even are starting to see manifest in your cultural context? Um, Sue, could you kindly start us off? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think uh, in, in Singapore, we, I would say that we felt the pandemic uh, uh, most substantially at the level of uh, infrastructure. You know, and, uh, <clears throat> for example, uh, you know, Singapore is a very small island uh, with a population of uh, 6 million. And, you know, uh, sort of uh, what is constantly on our minds uh, last year was supply chains. Uh, basically, most of our food stuff uh, is, is imported from the outside. So, uh, you know, so at the beginning of the pandemic, there were real uh, concerns uh, about sustenance. Uh, but as it went along, um, the way that the pandemic uh, unfolded in Singapore was that I think we, we could begin to feel a certain uh, division within our society. So for example, um, at a particular moment in time, the government started to release two separate sets of numbers uh, for daily infection rates. Uh, one of these sets of numbers is for um, citizens and the other sets of numbers were for the migrant workers in Singapore. Um, so you, the way in which uh, we were counting the infections was literally uh, split uh, into two. So um, the infections were relatively controlled amongst the citizens, um, but uh, the migrant workers had a really tough time uh, because uh, 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 these migrant workers were living in dormitories, which were uh, very packed, right? And um, so Singapore has a, a migrant worker population of about three, uh, 300,000 uh, people uh, with 
and we have only a population of like 6 million. So uh, this migrant uh, workforce is uh, integral to our economy. We could even say that our economic uh, system is built on a certain kind of uh, addiction to these kind of low cost labor. So they, they've all been packed into dormitories and that's why uh, the infection was uh, difficult to control uh, in these uh, dormitories. And um, these workers uh, continued almost for the entire year to live in very harsh conditions, um, sort of almost like a permanent lockdown. So we could see Singapore kind of like divided within itself, almost as this like internal camp that was uh, set up in Singapore. Um, so I would say that during, for, for us, uh, experiencing the pandemic was to see all of these inequalities, um, these infrastructural problems kind of coming up to the surface. I think in infrastructure is almost something that one doesn't think about when things seem to be functioning uh, smoothly. Um, but I think uh, last year, you know, uh, this uh, rupture <coughs> with the pandemic made us sort of feel these uh, infrastructures and its uh, inequalities uh, in a very uh, visceral and direct way. You know? So for me, um, you know, kind of looking at the situation from uh, sort of a cultural point of view, I think uh, it's, it's, you know, I mean, it started uh, me thinking about how to address these infrastructures, um, not only in the uh, speaking about these infrastructures, but how do we let these infrastructures speak? So, um, you know, that, that was for me one of my sort of like artistic questions uh, for, for last year. I think yeah. I'll stop. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Absolutely. And all, although we're in distinct contexts, we can, there's certainly conversations around kind of institutional, um, not even breakdowns because they're they are essentially structured in this way, but the kind of the lack um, of these infrastructural systems. And um, Serge, I'd love for you to also kind of answer this question about you know your local cult cultural context. Um, um, and then Sean and Simone, we'd love to hear from you afterward. Uh, thanks, uh, Jessica. Um, um, I'm zooming from Johannesburg, and our lockdown has the beginning was quite harsh and um you know we couldn't do the only thing you had to go out uh, for was just the essentials um but i don't think the dust has settled on this one yet to be able to see clearly how the various participants in the Johannesburg cultural community have dealt with and addressed and adopted to in the wake of COVID. um I dream of a world where there is more funding for the arts uh, to stimulate and support cultural productions. Um, I mean, Joburg as, as, as a major cultural hub uh, compared to uh, other cities in Europe, say Paris and, and New York, there's a huge disparity in terms of funding. Uh, you know, it's obvious, you know, third world, first world type of thing. But, um, I would like to, for there to be more art institutions like museums and theaters and galleries to show these productions. Um, uh, Joe Burgess is a city, I dream that there, where everyone can uh, have access to institutions and more people are knowledgeable enough to enjoy and uh, celebrate the arts. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Sean and Simone, we'd love to hear from you too. Simone? Oh, yep. Yeah. Um, it's such an interesting question, right? So uh, nearly a year ago, I left on a 10-day trip um, to co-chair oh, the um, Project Anywhere, um, Anywhere conference in Melbourne. And I'm still here a year later, um, courtesy of the pandemic. Um, and so in this case of kind of um, state of continual kind of transience, I guess, but you, you kind of ask the question of the potential futures um, and, and how do we imagine those? And one of the really beautiful things that happened with the Anywhere conference was we had to swiftly calibrate from uh, an in-person conference um, on campus in Melbourne to a conference which was handled digitally. 
and we really wondered like would we lose the kind of authenticity of the project anywhere um speakers and that wonderful community that you get from being in the same room with each other but what we found and i'm sure sean can attest to this as well was this amazing global community that came into play and of being able to put um, the melbourne conference is really based on local artists and being able to put those local artists out into the international um, context and we had some thousand people um, chime into it over four days and so from an audience which would have been about 120 um, in a small auditorium in Melbourne went to um, a much larger field. And so that was one of the really positive things that we found um, through this period. Sean? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's it's difficult to, I mean, we've been conspicuously fortunate here in Australia, really. Uh, yet, uh, obviously, the here in Melbourne, the second uh, lockdown, which lasted 112 days, has ravaged the arts community and really revealed, as, as it has around the world, the precarity of uh, um, so, so many workers in so many industries, but uh, certainly within the uh, arts industry. Uh, we've seen extraordinary, as we've seen around the world, innovation in terms of the ways, ways in which we've tried to reimagine these spaces. And I guess for some of us um, to, uh, to have to um, shift online or to do the, these kinds of projects in other kinds of ways without there being a, I guess, a neoliberal imperative to do so was, was an interesting challenge. I'm gonna shift actually um, and ask a question from one of our audience members. This is a question from Madeline Duffy, who writes, how can artists and curators engage with art on a global scale while not boxing in artists based on where they are from without mm -hmm. enc encountering the opposite problem of erasing the impact of an artist culture on their work? Where do we strike the balance between respectful cross-cultural dialogue and an understanding that the art world or the world in general is increasingly intercultural and blended? And I think that this is really the persistent question that we're dealing with between the global and the local and how we ethically address both sites. I'm not sure who would like to attempt that question first. I know there's a lot to say here. I wonder, would you mind, that's such an incredibly thoughtful, profound question. Could that be copied into the chat line so we can, because yep. there were so many parts to it. Too. Thanks so much. We've certainly seen, uh, even within this panel today, uh, it, despite the fact we're all you know, in, in a discussion that is global right now, we have all um, situated what we're, our discussion you know, in a local community. And uh, yeah, obviously this is uh, something that's um, playing out in real time very, very quickly at the moment. And this is a, a real moment of reckoning across a whole range of issues. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, it's it's a it's a curious and ongoing balancing act, and I think uh, we we can we we're getting it wrong and we're getting it right here and there, but uh, it's an evolving beast. What do others think? Yeah, you know, I I think this is uh, again like a sort of a very crucial question uh, for our time, and you know, I just want to think actually a little bit about the term global, you know, and, and globalization. I think, you know, there was a, this term for me uh, has associations of a certain uh, moment and a certain discourse. And, you know, I, I maybe, you know, I would like to bracket it by thinking about the planetary rather than um, the global. And I think our time is, is very much one of thinking about the planet. But at the same time, we are also thinking about the very local and the very specific. So maybe it's a, a, a way of thinking that uh, re requires us to calibrate the scale at which we are looking and to see that you know, things can operate simultaneously at, at different uh, scales. So the scale of the local uh, and also the scale of the planetary, I think, uh, you know, these are sort of uh, sort of interesting, uh, you know, things for us to consider uh, when we are practicing and thinking about the dissemination, uh, distribution and engagement uh, of our works. Sorry, Drew, I mean, you don't have to follow, 
follow up or we want to if you want a second to think on it i mean that's totally fine but we actually did have um in an earlier kind of conversation that we had as a group you know we actually talked about this kind of related to this question um from madeline duffy and thank you so much for that but it you know simone you brought up the the importance importance of building a responsible you know even ethical relationship to the context in which you work um you know the kind of urgency to situate or cite our work, which I think Madeline is is kind of getting at a little bit, but how do we, you know, it's almost kind of the, anti not antithetical to this question, but, you know, there is this kind of um, necessity of, of thinking about an ethical relationship to the histories and narratives of the lands in which we sit, work, or occupy. Um, mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you know, the pandemic has shifted the ways that we move through the world um, as patterns of circulations have changed. So, you know, how, what are the ways to kind of think about geographic specificity? And again, it kind of gets to this relationship between the global and the local, but kind of in a different uh, vantage point. Um, so Simone, because, you know, we, again, you brought this up in an earlier conversation, I'd love for you to, um, to speak on that. And then I'd also love for Sean and of course our incredible artists here to, to um, speak to that too. Um, I think Madeline's good just again, like really cut to the chase on that front. It's such a great question uh, or sequence of questions. And it's complex and it kind of deserves a panel in its own right. Um, I, I copied this really beautiful um, piece of short piece of writing from um, uh, Associate Professor Richard J. Franklin, um, who's at the University of Melbourne and he's from the Gajamara peoples. Um, and so he writes, when you have art, you have voice. And when you have voice, you have freedom. And when you have freedom, you have responsibility. Of course, freedom can be understood in many different kinds of ways, but it brings us to the question of responsibility um, and who are we, who and what are we responsible to? Uh, and there was another really lovely uh, short quote from Rhoda Roberts, um, who, who says that if you don't pay attention to land, it doesn't pay attention to you. And so this question of where we are at once very um, specifically located, um, courtesy of the pandemic, and we're also globally located, courtesy of our lives, this kind of simultaneous lives online, where does that attention get paid to? By being, um, and we have been under very strict restrictions here, so being on the very one piece of land here, it makes me think a lot about the history of this land that I grew up in um, and the um, possibility of engaging with it. So how do you enact that through the making of work? Um, one is to, to research the history of the land that you're citing the work on. Um, and who are the peoples who came before you and sit alongside of you in that land? Um, and what is the engagement of your ideas with that? Um, is it respectful to that? And do you have the right to tell that kind of narrative? Um, and how do you enact um, gaining uh, permission to um, enact the that work on that land? Um, one is to, is to contact the communities. And these are not um, kind of superficial writings of letters, but um, relationships that are built up over a really long period of time of respectful um, engagement. And I think about that as well as an educator. Um, and through the panelists on our the peer reviewers on Project Anywhere, what are the kind of inbuilt biases that we bring when we're reviewing artists' work for selection in Project Anywhere? Um, is that a product of our education in the readings that we've been given? How do we start to dismantle that? How do we call ourselves into question so that we enable a different kind of work to come into being? I'll leave it there for the moment. Um, if I may just jump in a bit, um, our previous uh, uh, question from our viewers or uh, whatever. Um, I, I think there needs to be more uh, the, the curators and the institutions showcasing uh, diverse uh, art uh, uh, need to be more brave in the sense that uh, the curation of work has to be with uh, within reason, without restrictions. And I mean, I mean restrictions imposed by institutions such as museums in terms of presentation of work. And I mean, uh, in specific to say the parameters of uh, of the installation, for example, or presentation of a work uh, accessible to the work. Say, for example, the work. Um, uh, kind of infringes on the institution's regulations of people's movement, for example. And that in turn infringes on the work itself. So there's a kind of a creation of um, 
uh, or participant participation from the museum itself to create the work further or restrict it further. So I, I, I would like to uh, see uh, um, uh, an instance whereby a work is given uh, its due in the sense that if an artist says, this is what I want to do, and this is how the work has existed in my studio or in my conception. Can I go ahead and do it the way I want it without the restrictions imposed uh, uh, on the work presentation in the end, which in a way that destroys the work itself. I've, I've faced this problem many times uh, where I've had to edit down my work so that it can fit in, in a place. And I have lost a bit of a bit of the work itself and a bit of meaning. Uh, so that's a very, it's quite a, a, it's subtle, but in the end, it takes away from the work. So I like, I would like to see, uh, well, I'd like to challenge, well, the, the curators out there and institutions out there uh, to be more brave in, in terms of how they present an artist's work and working with an artist to realize something that is just it's outside the, 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 the limits of you know, the institutional regulations. I'm gonna follow up on that question, Serge, and, and thank you so much for that um, encouragement for us as curators to be a bit braver in our work, um, to allow the artist um, to realize um, their, their vision without restrictions. But I'm actually interested in that question around the translation of the work from the studio to the museum and then now into the virtual space. And I think that might bring us to our last question. Um, but what happens for artists and art makers whose work cannot be translated online without losing something of its core potency? And I actually think that's something that we experienced in all of your work. Unfortunately, we've asked you all to do the impossible tonight. Um, but I guess I'm just interested to know a bit more um, about what you would say to address the fears um, of makers who um, an intimate connection rather than global visibility is their um, desire. I guess, how do you, can we, can we keep the sense of the intimacy of the work when you see it in person can we keep that in a world that is perhaps going to be increasingly mediated through the virtual? I don't think that's possible. Um, to be honest, I don't think it's possible. Um, it's, you know, if it's a sculpture trying to experience in real life and you somehow, you know, digitize it and make it into a 3D hologram, it's not the same, you know? It's not the same seeing the sun on the camera or on a screen as going outside and feeling it on your skin. That's how I see it. Sue, I mm. see you nodding. Yeah, yeah. no, I was uh, yeah, just thinking about what Serge uh, is saying. I think, uh, you know, I think for, for myself, maybe I have a very different uh, notion of what is work and practice. Uh, for me, I've, uh, stop thinking about uh, my own work as medium specific. Uh, rather for me, work as a project uh, is an ongoing uh, process and it needs to be, uh, for me, uh, adaptable. And um, we need, you know, for me, part of the interest of the work is, is in thinking about how it gets transformed every time it's plucked into a different uh, distribution uh, channel. So I think that of course, uh, as such, you know, mentioned, it's, it's an impossible task to translate a, a, a sculpture, uh, you know, through the internet. Um, but maybe it's uh, interesting to think about what the sculpturer can be, you know, rather than the sculpt sculpture, but the sculpturer uh, can be when it's uh, sort of meshed uh, with, a, with a different interface. You know? So I think uh, for myself, 
part of the interest of uh, you know my own sort of practice is is to see how it is transformed uh, by circumstance. So maybe the term translation is also interesting to to think about. Sometimes we think about translation as the attempt uh, to somehow uh, convey the original, and we we think about that process as uh, as as incorporating a certain loss of meaning with the translation. But what if you know we think about it differently? We think about translation as adding something to the original, you know, and so we think about uh, translation in a in a positive uh, sense as transformation, you know, so I'll leave it as at that. I wanted to add there, um, I was thinking about a performance that I saw here, and I guess it pertains to the earlier questions, which was by Bangara Dance Company, um, about a story which occurred on this land, and, and it has been performed in stages around the world, but in this case, it was enacted on the very land that it speaks the story of. And the powerful experience of that, of sitting on the ground, watching that, um, partially obscured because the land is so complex in its own right, so it's impossible to see it as you would see a normal stage. Um, with the kind of harbour in the background, with the boats going about their daily business, with this story that links us to a very powerful moment in this history, from in this land from which we can't return, almost like the event horizon, when one culture imposes on another. Um, so there's the experience of that physicality that cannot be had anywhere else, and I agree with Serge on that point, that can't be replicated. But to your point, Sue, of like, how does that get, um, how could it be translated? Um, and it comes back to the question we look at in Project Anywhere with the books, like you lose something and you gain something. Um, and that's the question, right? So it can't be the thing itself, but how can it be reiterated out and what does it gain in that process, acknowledging that there's loss as well, as it morphs into something else. And it's a conundrum, right? There's also the weird intimacy of the screen where it is just you with the work, even though it's kind of, perhaps there are bazillions of other people watching it at the same time, but you're not in a gallery with them aware of that. It's... Sean. Yeah, obviously uh, we're about to wind up here, but uh, the we're talking about many different kinds of projects and uh, it's obviously very difficult to um, make a meaningful generalization here, but certainly there are many instances in which we realize that there is more than one portal, if you will, into the world of the work, more than one materialization. And if we're gonna talk about the thing, the thing that is the work, we can't access without some kind of material form, but it can potentially exist in the spaces between the multiple iterations. So I think it, in some instances we get more when we encounter work through different multiple uh, portals. Well, because, I mean, we unfortunately had a very short hour to dive into really complicated, um, expansive um, themes here, but we're so grateful to all of our panelists, our incredible panelists. Um, we wish, I think that you can probably hear the virtual round of applause um, from our audiences, but I think that that's also a wonderful place to, to kind of, end this part of the conversation, which again, we hope is one of many, um, you know, of course, there has been so much loss. And um, during during this past, um, you know, during this time, but we're also seeing the kind of the potentialities through a lot of the cultural producers, including all of you here. And we're so grateful for your time and energies, um, especially, um, I will have to just single up Sue and, and Serge for staying up very late and also waking up very early to make sure that we're having this conversation publicly and you know in the flesh, so to speak, in the virtual realm for our audiences um, in real time. So we're so grateful um, to all of you and Sean and Simone, and of course my wonderful collaborators and colleagues at the Smart Museum. And of course, our sincerest thanks um, to all of our attendees for sticking with us on, on another Zoom, but we hope that this was an enriching conversation that we hope in, at some stage soon we can continue in person. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.